Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to start with uh, hearing about the other kind of uh, precision black hole experiments, namely uh, about uh, black hole imaging from Alex Duplaska at uh, Vanderbilt University. So please. All right, thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and for the first time. Uh, so today, I'm very excited to tell you about a bit of physics which is becoming more and more popular. Maybe you've heard about it, maybe not. I'm going to assume that it's new to you and walk you through the black hole photon ring. And this is meant to be a fun, interactive discussion. I hope that you'll understand everything I'm saying. And if anything is unclear, please stop me. I'd rather we go through less material, but everybody gets everything I'm saying. OK, so super interactive. All right, so I have this uh, cool video for my astronomer friends. This is an actual video of the real sky. So you point your camera to the sky. There's some uh, constellations, Virgo, Leo, and you start zooming in. And uh, this is the region of the sky um, where M87, a distant galaxy that's 50 million light years away from us, lies. And all of these images are actual real images that have been taken by various instruments listed at the bottom here over the past several decades. And in fact, there's a jet, which is the famous jet of M87. It stretches over a million light years. This has been measured decades ago now, and the recent development in the last uh, four years, since 2019, is that we've achieved higher than ever before resolution images of the core of the, the jet. And uh, the images have revealed this dark patch, which we think is indicative of there being a black hole at the center of the galaxy. Okay, so this is the first black hole image. Like I said, this object that we're seeing is 50 million light years away but it's also bigger than our solar system. It's a black hole that is super massive and weighs about six billion solar masses. And so it's extremely large, but it's also extremely far away. And as a result, the angular size in the sky of this object is the same as the size of an orange on the surface of the moon as seen from the earth. Okay, so the fact that we even have this image is an astonishing achievement. If you watch the announcement, the big reveal of this image, the first two questions by journalists were basically, why is it so blurry? And it's kind of annoying when you understand just how crazy this is. And I think this video illustrates the incredible journey that we had to, to go on just to get here. Yeah, is there? Oh, okay, I thought it was better. So uh, it, it's an incredible technological achievement. And more importantly, in some sense, it's the hardest to take the first picture once you have the first picture, you know that it's basically an engineering problem from now on. And we're definitely going to get better pictures. And the question now is just, what are we going to see? And what is it going to teach us? So I want to explain the main features that we think we're going to be able to see in black hole images, why they're interesting, and uh, what they can tell us about the nature of black holes and gravity. So this is what we've seen. But we have these super duper GRMHD simulations. GRMHD means General Relativistic Magnetohydrodynamics. So it's a theory of a charged fluid, like the plasma that we think is lighting up around the black hole in curved space time. And it's very expensive to run simulations of these GRMHD fluids, but there's about 40 of them that have been run on supercomputers. And we can ray trace images of these simulated plasmas and say, you know, according to our best theory of what we think is around the black hole, what does it look like at perfect resolution. And so this is one image from one of these simulations. Um, there's actually 40 simulations, but you can uh, take, you can make movies of them because they're time dependent. And so you, yeah, there's actually millions of images that have been ray traced of these configurations. This is just one of them. But the key thing that I want to point out here is that across all these different simulations with different astrophysical conditions, different plasmas, there is always one feature that dominates the image. And it's always the same striking feature. What do you notice? There's a very bright ring here. OK? There's a very bright and narrow ring that dominates the image. So that's the first surprising thing. And the second surprising thing is that it's always there, regardless of what you do to the astrophysical plasma. In all of these dry image simulations, these million images that we've simulated, super duper fancy supercomputer simulations, it always looks like this. So how can that be? Yeah. Does it tell you that 
we are very bad at simulating plasmas and we only know how to simulate a narrow region in the plasma parameter space or so that's a reasonable worry and um actually if there's one thing we've learned from the recent release of the sagittarius safe star data so that's the second black hole that we've imaged um the data was released last year or two years ago now i guess what we learned from it is that none of the gr imagedd models perfectly match the data in every aspect so actually there's something wrong with these models i think it's fair to say that gr imagedd has never actually been tested in the real world so it could be an elaborate fiction for all we know um I, and i think that's an important thing to highlight because for instance daniel this morning showed us these ray traced images of simple equatorial models and some people complain that oh it's too naive to do that but i actually from my perspective i think it's totally fine and it's not clear that the super expensive super computer simulations are that much better so um there's some arguments for why the plasma should be such that it thermalizes in uh the direction transverse to the magnetic field lines but it's actually collisionless in the direction along the field lines and so the underlying assumption of grmhd which is that you have a thermalized fluid that, that doesn't technically apply so there's no real reason why this has to be correct it probably isn't correct in fine details that being said you know it's better than i'm making it sound what i'm trying to say is that it may not be a completely accurate guess but it is our best guess and it's probably not too far off either there's a large industry of plasma physicists now that are getting activated and saying this is perfect a perfect reason for us to spend the next 10 years understanding the beyond gr imagedd effects like this is not an ideal imagedd fluid there's resistivity there's uh current sheets there's plasma instabilities and it's probably going to take them 10 years to really figure it all out but in the first simulations they've made the presence of the ring is still there and there's a good reason for that and so the reason this ring is always present and this is the main point of of the talk and this is why the photon ring is interesting to us who are interested in in gravity is that it's always present because it's actually the part of the image that belongs to the black hole itself and not to the circulating plasma. So what we're seeing in this ring is actually lensed emission. It's an image of the stuff around the black hole but that we see from photons that orbit it around it probe the strong gravitational field just outside the event horizon and then escape through to our telescopes and reach us carrying information about the space-time geometry just outside the event horizon. And that's exciting because I'm going to argue it's a very precise probe of gravity in the strong field regime. So in some sense uh, the keyword here is universality. This is a universal feature of black hole images because no matter what astrophysical profile you put and I think pretty much regardless of the fine details of the plasma physics as long as there's a source that lights up and sends light some of the light will bend around the black hole and will get lensed to produce this characteristic pattern. And so uh we're used to thinking that electromagnetic observations of black holes are much more sensitive to the astrophysics of the source than to the geometry of the space-time. And I think this is a, actually an, a very important exception where that's not the case. Like you if you see this ring you're really getting uh, uh an image of the of the space-time and a way to think about it that's fun is if you go to a department store you try on different clothes and then you go into one of these cubicles with the mirrors and you know if there are multiple mirrors you see infinitely many images of yourself so the first image that you see of yourself in the mirror is just showing you the clothes that you're wearing but nobody cares about the clothes i'm wearing what's interesting is that by looking at higher images in the mirror so the relation between all the images that you see in multiple mirrors you can actually learn about the geometry of the room and the setup of the mirrors so this is the idea here the black hole acts like a lens it's a hole of mirrors and uh there's some plasma that you can see here actually that's flowing into the black hole the actual event horizon is this totally dark patch and you can see there's plasma flowing all the way onto the horizon So it's almost exactly the intersection of the equatorial plane with the horizon because in these models most of the emission that you see is actually pretty much near equatoria. So in general you can have models where uh there's foreground emission but 
in these simulations, it ends up being the case that most of the emission you see is from the equatorial plane. And there's basically plasma going all the way into the uh, is, horizon. Is it, is, is where the dark flash table across different uh, simulations and the size? Um, yeah, pretty much with the caveat that <laughs> the redshift actually becomes infinite here. So it's very hard to see the, the actual sharp location of, of the horizon. But in principle, if you had perfect, uh, this is called the inner shadow. It's kind of orthogonal to this talk, but yeah. it's a very interesting signature. And the NGHT, which is currently being planned, is the perfect machine to actually see this this dark patch within the ring. And I think there is really interesting information buried in there. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus only on the photon ring. And the photon ring, the catchphrase is, is the image of the black hole itself. OK. Sorry, one, one more yeah. point. There's no complicated information. It's stated at, at the state about the inner shadow. So the inner shadow is not as universal. You have to say something about the geometry of the source. So if you say that I know that the emitter is in the equatorial plane, it's like an equatorial disk, then we can compute the shape of this inner shadow exactly. I have a paper where we did that. But it depends, of course, if the source is not exactly in the equatorial plane, it's a different shape. You can always compute it, but to predict the shape of this darker patch in the middle, this inner shadow, you have to know something about the geometry of the astrophysical source, the stuff that's lighting up. Whereas for the photon ring, you don't even need to know that. It's a much more robust prediction. And so that's why it's a more interesting target. And I think it'll be easier to measure, actually. OK. So thank you for the questions. Let me, let me explain how this photon ring effect comes about. It's a quite intricate and rich story. So the reason that this occurs is because a black hole can have something called a photon shell. Now, this is something that actually has been known for a long time, but I think it's fair to say it wasn't on people's minds. And only since uh, the Event Horizon Telescope released its image have people really started to revisit this. And there's been a lot of progress in understanding the structure of this shell. And I'm going to describe that to you now. So the point is, there is this region of space time, which is outside the Event Horizon, that's represented by a dark patch here. Um, so because we're outside the Event Horizon, that means light can come into this region, this shell, and then escape again. However, gravity in this region is strong enough that it is possible for light rays to get captured on bound orbits and just get stuck at fixed Borelinquist radius around the black hole. Now, of course, this is a coordinate dependent statement. And, but actually, the standard Borelinquist coordinates have the defining feature. You can define them to be the coordinates in which the bound orbits are at fixed radius. So uh, this is the R theta plane in Borelinquist coordinates. And uh, there is a region of space time around the, the black hole, which is outside the event horizon. So we can get signals from it. But in which gravity is so strong, the light is deflected so much that it, it's bent into spherical orbits. And uh, so this is a black hole of spin about 94%. The ergosphere would be kind of this apple that starts at the pole and then comes here, it always crosses at 2m. So it would, it would cross the equator about here. Um, the ergosphere turns out not to be really important for this story. So that's why I'm not including it. But uh, it's a good question. So a Schwarzschild black hole, which is, yes, DJ? This is photons that have some particular momentum. Clearly, if you point them straight in or straight out, they're going to get out because they're outside the in, inner horizon, right? Very good point. So you're anticipating okay. one of these uh, points I'm going to make, but, but let me say it now. So to be clear, if you, if you have a photon that crosses into the event horizon, it can never come back out. That's the definition of the event horizon. If you have a photon in the shell, it can be trapped, but actually it really doesn't want to be trapped. It's very hard to, to trap light. So actually, these bound orbits are unstable. So if you're here holding a flashlight in the shell, you can only load a photon onto a bound orbit if you aim perfectly well. So if you're at some radius in the shell, you have to aim your flashlight such that the photon stays at that radius. You have to aim perfectly well in your sky. And only then will the light be captured. But you have to aim infinitely well for it to really be captured forever because these bound orbits are unstable. They're all unstable. 
And the slightest deviation in their initial momentum will push the photons either in or out. So generically, you'll, you'll, send a, you'll have your flashlight here, you'll aim it, the photon will kind of skirt one of these bound orbits, but it'll eventually either fall into the black hole or escape to our detector, which by the way is why we see the photon ring. This is why I'm going through all this. Okay, so let me describe the shell. First, everybody here is very familiar with Schwarzschild. If you have a Schwarzschild black hole, the event horizon radius is 2m. And then the shell actually shrinks into a sphere. There's a single radius where you can have bound photons. And that's the sphere at r equals 3m. And those photons have zero angular momentum. In particular, they're allowed to pass over the poles. As you spin up the black hole, the sphere, it actually thickens into a shell. And so there are different orbital radii now within the shell where light can get captured. And which orbital radius a photon gets captured on depends on its angular momentum. So the photons get, that get trapped on the white circle are allowed to pass over the poles. That's the only uh, orbit where you can actually explore the entire sphere. And those are the zero angular momentum photons, which are the only ones allowed to cross over the poles. As you go inwards towards the black hole, you're looking at uh, bound photons with positive angular momentum. They're prograde, they're co-rotating with the black hole. And the very last one is the circular equatorial prograde orbit. And as you go out from the white sphere, actually the photons are start to counter rotate. So they're retrograde and have negative angular momentum. And the last one is also a circular equatorial, but now retrograde orbit. And uh, the shell actually, as you spin up the black hole, the event horizon shrinks to R equals M at extremality. And the shell thickens from M to 4M. That's as big as it can get. OK? So that's the geometry of this region of space time. But we really should think of it as a region of phase space, because it's not just a place in space time, but it's also uh, a region where the photons are aimed just right. And so they have to have a particular momentum. So we should really think of it as a region of phase space. Now, I'm going to use the terminology of orbit to describe how photons actually move around this shell. And when I say orbit, I'm going to really mean the theta motion, the polar oscillation or libration in classical mechanics. So one orbit is when a photon goes from the bottom to the top and then back down. And so if it does just, uh, if it goes just from the bottom to the top, that's a half orbit. Or, or from the top to the bottom. Okay, that's my terminology. And as a photon does a half orbit, it actually doesn't come back to where it started in phi. So in the azimuthal direction, it winds around the black hole by some amount, uh, which is a function of the mass, spin, and orbital radius. And so for each of these parameters, for each orbital radius, there's a number delta which is the azimuthal angle delta phi that swept in a half orbit. And Leo Stein on his website, due to symmetry.com, I encourage you to go there. It's super fun. He has a live 3D Java applet where you can change the spin of the black hole and the orbital radius, and you can see these uh, bound orbits animated in real time. It's really fun. And you can see that uh, because delta uh, generically doesn't give you a, a rational ratio of delta phi to delta theta, these orbits don't actually come back into themselves and they kind of ergodically explore their sphere. Okay, so uh, I wanna introduce four critical parameters which are intrinsically defined by the geometry of the photon shell. They're local quantities that are predicted by the Kerr geometry in which we analytically computed in the past four years uh, in Kerr and that fully characterize the, the behavior of these light rays and then it turns out that they fully characterize the photon rings in it. So these four parameters are delta, which I've just described. And the second one is tau, which is just as a photon goes from the bottom to the top, it does one half orbit, how long does that take? There's a time lapse incurred that we call tau. So delta and tau, is that clear to everybody? Okay, and then uh, there's gamma and mu, which are a little bit trickier. So let me just describe mu very quickly. Notice that uh, the maximal inclination of these bound photons varies with the orbital radius. So like I said, when you have zero angular momentum and you're on this white circle, theta max is actually zero. They go all the way to the pole. And so sine of theta max is zero. But as you go inwards, 
sine of the maximal theta angle of the orbit actually goes to plus one because here the last orbit is equatorial. So it's always at pi equals pi over two and sine of pi over two is, is one. And I'm gonna define mu to be the sine inclination of the orbit where I add a sine, which is the angular momentum of the orbit. So I'm gonna declare that these guys have positive sine theta, the ones with positive angular momentum and the ones that are out there have negative sine theta. So sine theta is this parameter mu, it parameterizes the orbital radii in the photon shell going from plus one here, smoothly decreasing to zero here and then smoothly decreasing to minus one. Is that clear? Mu is clear? This is like the only hard slide because I have to introduce these fancy quantities. And we have exact analytic expressions for all of them in terms of elliptic integrals. You know, they're all very nice things. Okay, and so that's delta, tau, and mu. And the last, yes? Yeah, so uh, are you here like solving the geodesic equations or are you solving yeah, yeah. the equation for the whole perturbation the equation in the crisp space time, it's fully solvable. You can represent the solutions. It's an integrable system. The solutions are given by Jacobi elliptic functions, which are just the generalization of cosine and sine to, to an ellipse from a circle to an ellipse. They're 200 year old functions. They're very nice. There's a hundred identities. Like you can say everything exactly analytically about what, about what any photon in Kerr is doing. Um, but so this you is know, like special photons. That that's are... like a first approximation, right? Like because the the waves themselves they perturb the black hole. I'll so get to the how wave about black in hole a second. perturbation theory. I'll get to the wave in a second. So th there's there's two things you might worry about. One is a perturbation of the background geometry. Uh, but these black holes are you know the way this M87 weighs six billion solar masses, and the matter around it has like the fraction of the mass. All the plasma around the black hole is a minute fraction of the mass of the black hole. It's totally negligible. For Sagittarius A star, if it, that one has four million solar masses, but if it had, if you normalized it to be the mass of a human being, the total inflow of plasma onto Sagittarius A star, the black hole, the center of our galaxy, would amount to a human being eating one grain of rice every million years. Okay, so if you're worried about corrections to the Kerr geometry, you don't need to worry about that. We're talking about a grain of rice every million years. Another thing you might worry about is that we're describing the light uh, using the null geodesic equation. So we're treating it as photons. And that's a good approximation of the geometric optics limit, which is an expansion in the wavelength of the light divided by the characteristic radius of curvature of, of the system. So this is a solar system sized object. So that's its characteristic radius of curvature. And the wavelength of the light that we're observing at the Event Horizon Telescope is 230 gigahertz or 1.3 millimeters. So we're expanding in 1.3, you know, we're the size of the solar system measured in millimeters. So that's what suppresses the corrections. So everything I'm telling you is perfectly fine. No geodesics on Kerr, you're never gonna need anything else. But you're right to worry about these things in principle. Okay. So uh, I've described delta tau and mu. And the last one I want to describe is, is gamma. So gamma. Sorry, so this red thing closes or not? So there is a measure zero set of radii for which uh, the ratio delta phi, for which delta phi is like a, a rational number. And then these orbits perfectly close. And there's some interesting physics associated with that, which we're probably not going to see because it's a measure zero thing. But generic orbits don't close, they're ergodic. Yeah. This is like so fascinating. I mean, and these numbers have been computed for the first time in the like the last three, four years, but you could there's some, you know, there's a lot of crazy structure there. So the, the most important one, actually going back to I think it was Vijay's point. Uh, if you're here and you want to load a photon onto this orbital shell, you have to aim your flashlight just right. It has to be that the photon has no radial momentum, otherwise it's gonna move away. So if you either give it a bit of radial momentum or, or if you keep it with the right momentum, but you give it a little kick, any small perturbation will kick this photon away. And then you solve the equation of geodesic deviation, the Jacobi equation. And it's a simple calculation to show that the change in radius as a result of this instability will actually be exponentially growing in the number N of half orbits. 
So every time, if you have a bound photon, but you give it a little kick, then basically it's gonna keep oscillating up and down and skirting one of these perfectly bound orbits, but, it, but because they're unstable, it's gonna move away exponentially fast. And the radial distance from where it should be trapped will grow exponentially in the number n of half orbits. And the exponent governing this instability is this Lyapunov exponent gamma. Okay, so delta tau and mu have to do with what the perfectly bound orbits are doing. And gamma is just saying how a nearly bound photon moves away from this shell. Is that clear? Okay, this was the hard part. So now I've introduced uh, the geometry of the photon shell and the intrinsic properties of these bound orbits. And now I'm gonna connect that to what we see because that's what's relevant for observations. So the first thing is that we have to understand the behavior of the black hole as a lens. And there's a key point here, which is suppose you have a single source, say in the equatorial plane of the black hole. Well, actually you can prove that in the curved geometry, any two spatial points are connected by infinitely many null geodesics. And in fact, these geodesics can be labeled by their winding number around the black hole. So you can have a light ray that goes directly to the observer, which I haven't plotted here. These are actual real geodesics. You can have one that shoots down, but then bends around the black hole and goes back up. Or you can have one that shoots up, but gets captured, skirts the, orb, skirts the photon shell for a full orbit and then goes back up. And so if you're up out there, which is where we're sitting with our telescopes, you'll see multiple images of the same source, uh, which is connected to you by multiple light rays. And we've understood in the last few years in very precise detail how all of this works and we can prove everything analytically, it's very nice. And I'll show you the uh, full complete answer in the simplest case. In the general case, it's horrendously complicated, but here's the simplest case. So let's look at the right-hand side first. Suppose we have a spinning curved black hole and there's an equatorial source and we're looking at it from above. So we're exactly on the spin axis. So this is a bit of an artificial case, but I can, I can in two minutes show you exactly how everything runs. So uh, there's gonna be some light that shoots up directly. We're gonna call that the N equals zero light because it's, it's coming at us uh, directly. And then there's gonna be some light that's shot downwards actually, but does one extra half orbit around the black hole before being lensed back to the observer. We're gonna call that N equals one. And then there's gonna be an N equals two image that does two extra half orbits around the black hole. So it circumnavigates the black hole once before going up. And in principle, there's N equals three and N equals four and so on and so forth. And here's the key fact. Whatever the zeroth image is, that GR cannot tell you because it's just showing you what's actually around the black hole. And that depends on the astrophysics of the plasma. There's some source there, it's lighting up. It is whatever it is. You need to go out and see what it is to, to know. So the N equals zero image is just purely astrophysics. It's just with the clothes I'm wearing when I go to the department store. But if you know the nth image, then the next image, the N plus one image is completely fixed by the curved geometry and the behavior of the black hole as a lens. Uh, because you're just seeing these photons that skirted in the bound photon orbits in the photon shell. It's kind of like saying the direct image in my mirror, the department store is just showing what I'm wearing. The higher images are then fixed once you know what I'm wearing, just from knowing the geometry of, of the room. Okay, so here I'm saying, suppose that uh, this image of, you have an equatorial disk that you're looking at from the axis, and suppose that the nth image is this color wheel. This is totally artificial. It's not what real book plasmas look like, but this is just to illustrate how the lensing works. So suppose it's this color wheel. Well, it turns out that there's a special curve in your image plane. So now you're an observer, you have your telescope, you're looking at the sky. There's a special theoretical curve, which I've drawn here in black, which is called the critical curve. And some people call it the shadow. I don't love the shadow term because it's not an observable curve. It's a mathematical curve, which is not in itself observable. But what is this curve? Well, think of it this way. Suppose you, you're looking at a black hole in the sky and you shine your flashlight towards the black hole. If you aim your flashlight towards the black hole, then the photons will actually fall in and get absorbed in the event horizon. That's what happens if you aim sort of in here. If you aim your flashlight very far away, then you know the photons might get bent a little bit by the black hole, but they'll only be mildly deflected and escape back out to infinity. So if you aim your flashlight very far away, 
photons get back to infinity. If you aim towards the black hole, they get captured. But what happens in between? So this critical curve, which was analytically derived by Bardeen for the first time in 1973, is the region in the sky that delineates the region of photon capture from the region of photon escape. And what happens if you aim a photon towards the black hole, but exactly on that curve? Well, it can neither, it can neither fall into the black hole, that's the interior of the curve, nor escape back out to infinity, that's the exterior of the curve. So what happens if you aim exactly on the curve? Exactly. Then that, the photons will asymptote to one of these bound photon orbits. They'll fall in towards the black hole and actually get trapped on in the photon shell. And actually, <laughs> which angle you point around the image will determine which radius which orbital radius the photon gets captured by. And that's crazy because when you look at a star, if you look around the star in the image, you're seeing around the star in the geometry. You're seeing delta phi, you're changing delta phi in the image, you're changing delta phi in the geometry. But with these, with Kerr lensing, when you go around this critical curve, which is the image of the asymptotically bound orbits, as you vary phi around the image, you're not varying phi around the black hole, you're varying the radius. But at every point on this curve, you're actually seeing the same radius, but at every phi at the same time. So this is the warped nature of space-time in your face. OK? So now, here's how lensing works. Yeah? So are you just saying that the, the curve potential is also not only a radial dependence like Schwarzschild, but it also has a theta dependence? And then I'm looking at photons at the peak of the potential. And when I look at different angles, of course, the, the, the peak will be a different radii for different angles. Or are you saying something more than I'm missing? So if you're if you point a black if you point a photon towards the black hole, but you aim it at a different angle around this image, then it'll have a momentum such that its radial potential will have its peak at a different radius. Right. That's all I'm saying. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So hopefully I haven't confused anyone else. Is that? OK, so now finally I can explain the full, the, the full shebang. Here's how lensing works. So if this is the nth image of the disk, the n plus 1th image is completely fixed by the Kerr geometry. And there's only three effects that you need to worry about. The first effect is a demagnification. This next image will be squeezed in closer to this critical curve. And we call that a demagnification effect. And that makes sense because these orbits are unstable. So if you want your photon to do an additional orbit, you have to aim much more precisely. The fact that they're unstable means that to be perfectly trapped, you have to aim infinitely perfectly well on this critical curve, which you can never do. But as you approach the critical curve, the photons that you're seeing have orbited the black hole an increasing number of times. But if you want to see a photon with an additional turn, you have to get exponentially closer to this curve. And the amount by which you have to get exponentially closer, this distance, has to be exponentially closer by e to the minus gamma, where gamma is the Lyapunov exponent. So the critical exponent that was governing the instability of the orbits <laughs> intrinsically in the photon shell actually ends up controlling the demagnification factor. It's not obvious, but it's really cool. So that's the first effect. For a Schwarzschild black hole, in this configuration, e to the minus gamma is exactly e to the minus pi, which is 4.3%. That's been known actually since uh, David Hilbert in 1917, which kind of blew my mind. Um, remember, GR 1915, Schwarzschild 1916, 1917, David Hilbert understood this for Schwarzschild. It's pretty nuts. OK, if the black hole has greater spin, then this demagnification factor is a little bit smaller, and so you have a slightly thicker next image. That's the first effect. The second effect is that the image rotates. And this is obvious from this picture here, right? Because the light that you're seeing from the n equals 0 is coming at you from one direction. But then the, the light that you're seeing from n equals 1 is actually coming at you from the opposite direction. And so if you had a, a circular disk, it would just look like as you go from n equals 0 to 1, you're, you've rotated it by exactly 180 degrees. So delta, in this case, is 180 degrees. As you spin up the black hole, there's a frame dragging effect. And so the amount by which the color wheel rotates increases 
from exactly half a turn to almost exactly three quarters of a turn if the black hole is extremal. And that's the fact that uh, you know, the photon had to do an additional half turn, which made it sweep an extra angle delta. And lastly, that takes an extra time tau by definition. And so the image is time delayed by tau, which is actually pretty much flat for any spin. It's about 15 or 16 m. So for m87, m in units of time is about nine hours. That's gm over c cube. And so 6m is about the 16m is about nine, uh, six days. So you expect an M87 to see light echoes every six days. Okay. So what did, what did I do? I took the geometry of the photon shell, defined some quantities intrinsically there, but I showed, I connected them to the lensing behavior of the black hole, which is completely controlled by gamma delta tau. So if you see one image of the source, the next image will be controlled by gamma delta tau, according to this simple relation here. It couldn't be simpler. Okay. So now let me put it all together. What happens when you have some source that surrounds the black hole and shoots photons from all over the place? Well, you're going to get a, a direct image of the stuff that's there. That's the astrophysics. GR can't tell you what that is. It's just what is around the black hole. So there'll be these weakly lensed photons that are only slightly deflected that show you the plasma around the hole. And that you have to actually do the measurement to know what it is. But on top of that, you'll have n equals one photons. They're emitted by the plasma and then do a U-turn before shooting back to the telescope. And because they, they have to, they get lensed in this way, they appear in this sort of ring-like region, which is the first photon ring. But actually there will be multiple mirror images of all the stuff around the black hole from photons that do a higher number of orbits. So for instance, these are the n equals two uh, photons that do two half orbits. They circumnavigate the black hole the entire time before reaching you, but they had to be aimed exponentially closer to the shell for that to happen. So they ended up lens into an exponentially narrower ring. And of course, this is, this is the NM, so everything superposes linearly. And the full image that you see is just the sum of all the layers. So you see a total image, which is the n equals 0 background, plus the n equals 1 image, which is uh, this first still fairly thick ring. And then inside of that is an extremely sharp, narrow n equals 2 ring, and so on and so forth. Yes, Vijay? Uh, Okay. Why is the shadow in the middle uh, off center? That's because of the spin of the black hole. So this is a black hole that has 90, I think it's 94% spin. And uh, this goes back to Ibu's question. So in this simulation, the emission is pretty much near equatorial. So this completely dark patch is actually, we call it the inner shadow. It's the intersection of the event horizon with the equ equatorial plane. And whereas the photon ring is the image of the perfectly bound orbits or nearly bound orbits. And these have a relative offset due to the frame dragging of the black hole. So because this photon shell exists really in 3D, you know, it's a 3D spatial thing. And uh, there's a preferential frame dragging effect. If the black hole is extremal, actually the side that's where the photons are coming to you becomes a vertical line, which is really <laughs> dramatic. And actually it's connected to ADS-3. We can talk about that if you want. There's an ADS-3 in there, which is not, um, yeah, right. There's, okay. But it, it's kind of like we don't think we're going to see that, but it, there's a really cool intricate stuff in there. Okay. So thank you for all the questions. I hope this makes the talk intelligible and fun. Uh, yes? Thank you. So what, what are the actually, chances of actually seeing these higher rings? So I, I'm very. I'm very confident we're going to see the n equals one in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And there's a chance we'll see n equals two as well. There's certainly, we're trying for it. There's actual NASA proposals being submitted as we speak to, to do this. And I'm, that's what I'm going to finish on. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to, I think in my lifetime, the question, I don't know if I'm going to have gray hair or not, but, <laughs> but we're going to see this. All right, but so far we haven't seen this. There have been some bogus claims in the literature uh, which are very annoying that we've seen the photon. It's all nonsense. We haven't seen this. Uh, however, you know, it isn't just pure sci-fi. So in these state-of-the-art GRMHD simulations, at least there, we can confirm numerically that the story that I've told you, which is analytically derived, matches precisely what we see in numerical simulations. So this is a, a timed average image of a super-duper GRMHD simulation that George Wong made. He works for the Event Horizon Telescope, and he's their Mr. GRMHD. And here I'm showing you two cross sections of this image. So the intensity profile is a vertical cut and a horizontal cut. 
across the intensity. And you can see that there's sort of these shoulders here, which are the n equals zero image. And then on top of that, there's these additional spikes, which are the photon ring. And if you zoom in, you can actually decompose the emission that you're getting, the intensity, by contributions from photon that did different numbers of orbits. And uh, there's a background n equals zero image. And then on top of that, there's this peak, which is visible in the image as the first photon ring. And then there's an even sharper peak within it, which is n equals two. And you can actually see n equals three. And George could see up to n equals six. And then at some point, the ray tracer craps, I don't know, there's some numerical limit. But this stuff is really there, at least in the simulations. All right. Now, uh, I do want to say that we're calling this the photon ring, even though we're solving the null geodesic equation. So there's nothing actually specific to light being composed of photons. And in fact, uh, Verlin, the, Herman Verlin, the, you know, he likes to call it the graviton ring. We could have called it the graviton ring also. And I want to connect this physics to uh, the quasi normal mode spectrum, which we've heard about this morning from Gregorio, and actually highlight that uh, this is a different window into the same physics. So this is the first LIGO detection. Um, and as Grigori explained this morning, when you have two merging black holes, you get this kind of waveform that has three phases. There's this initial phase, which is the slow in spiral that gives a, a low frequency ringing. Then there's the uh, dynamical merger phase, which is very rapid and highly nonlinear. And then at late times, you have a final black hole, which rings down with these exponentially damp sinusoids, which are the quasi normal modes. So we just heard about this. I'm not going to go into it in detail. But what I want to tell you is that the photon ring actually controls the black hole ring down. And how does that work? There's no one blocked from a previous slide that makes you know what's happening. The zoom is blocked from a slide before. The zoom is blocked from a slide. Right, yeah. Should I? Can you get that scene just for this? Yes, Bogdan. So you said that we have not officially observed any, any photon ring. We have not resolved the photon ring. Yeah. We have not. So uh... Yeah, and the, the reason is this image that you see here, let me say it more in a simpler way. Mm -hmm. If you blur it to mock up the very poor resolution that we have today, this image with just the background plasma that you can see swirling in, mm -hmm. or the same image with the photon ring added on top, mm -hmm. both of these images, with or without photon ring, if you blur them, they give you an image which is consistent with what we've actually seen. OK, so are you telling me that if I, if I take any massive object in the sky, maybe a neutron star or whatever, and I look at its lensing on, on light that I shine from behind on it, I will, get, I will get this type of image? Well, I think it has to be a black hole for there to be a dark patch. I mean, I think that the dark patch is pretty indicative of it being a black hole, because how else can you do that? I don't, I don't know. OK. Uh, so I think the fact that we resolve the core and there's a dark batch, you know, it, it's not 100% foolproof, but it's strong evidence for it being a black hole. OK. But whether it's a black, you know, but, but does it have a photon ring of orbiting light? That we can't tell for sure, because the data is consistent with the ring being there or not being there. Mm -hmm. okay. Either way, if you ray trace with or without these photons, you blur the image to the actual resolution of the instrument, and it looks the same and okay. consistent with the data. OK, thank you. And black hole here means something that's very because otherwise, why are we talking about black holes? Right? So uh, the, the the photon ring, which is the most striking part of feature in the image, is composed of light that wasn't emitted near the horizon, and it's not a strong redshift. No, no, I, I mean I meant about the dark patch. Uh, is, is... The dark patch is there because once you cross the horizon, there's no light coming out. And as you get close to the horizon, the emission gets dimmer and dimmer. No, no, I understand that. But I mean, the, yeah. you're just requiring that there's something which redshifts light so much that it looks dark. Yes. It doesn't have to yeah, be Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. fuzzball that redshifts yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. That, in a that way could mimic this. And that, yeah, as Daniel has explored. OK. Should I? Do you have an actual measurement of 
Good question. So the EHT, the current instrument, the Event Horizon Telescope, um, so I could do a whole hour just on interferometry, which is how we actually measure these images. I'll say some things about it. It's a very, very complicated story. And a lot of what I'm doing is bridging the gap to understand how you connect these images to actually to actual observables. And there's, there's a lot of complicated things. So one issue is dynamic range. That's the key concept. So dynamic range is given an actual interferometer, like the Event Horizon Telescope. It turns out that there's a floor on what you can see in the following sense. If you have a pixel in your image, which is the brightest pixel, it turns out that any other pixel that has less than 10% of the flux will actually be invisible to the instrument. So we say that the EHT has a dynamic range of 10. So whatever the brightest thing is in the image, anything that's under 10% of its, of its brightness, you just is invisible to you. So, so in the next two, three years, I think we're going to have the NGHD come online, which is going to have many more elements in the interferometric array. And that actually turns out not to help you with the resolution. The image won't get less blurry, but it will improve the dynamic range tremendously to at least 100, if not 1,000. So we'll be able to now see things which are 100 or even 1,000 times dimmer than the brightest pixel. And that's exactly the kind of thing you want to be able to see if there's an inner shadow or what its shape is, which is why I think it's an interesting thing to, to explore separately. But it's kind of orthogonal to this photon ring. OK, should I? OK, I'll wait a little bit. All right, more questions. I get to uh, entertain. So. Um, Okay, well, let me let me tell you a bit about interferometry while while we wait. Right, we're good. Okay, great. And can we close the? Yeah. Would you mind if I? All right. So I want to connect the photon ring to black hole ring down, and I point out to you that it's the same physics in both cases. Like Gregory said this morning, we're seeing the peak of the radial potential, not the horizon of the black hole, which is an important point. He also pointed this out. So this is a, an animation from the LIGO collaboration of two merging black holes. So this is the slow wind spiral phase where they're orbiting each other. And then at some point there's gonna be a rapid coalescence when they merge, and then there will be a final black hole which quickly relaxes to its final state. And what I wanna focus, what I want you to focus on is this part of the image. So we're approaching merger, the coalescence is gonna be very rapid, there's still two horizons, but now they merge, boom, and look at that. You see that ring? So the last, Part of the, let me play this again because I think it's really cool. I love this. So, the last part of the space time that ripples when the black holes merge is, is this ring. And it has to do with caustics, but it's basically the same thing as the photon ring. Uh, I can explain it in detail afterwards. It's the region that separates the first n equals zero image from the n equals one image. Uh, but it shouldn't surprise you that the very last signal that you get in the ring down is connected to the peak of the radial potential, which is the photon ring. Well, that's too far out. Very good observation. So you're very you're eagle-eyed. That's why it's not exactly the critical curve. But that's because the camera in this animation is very close to the black hole. So we're looking for uh, the black hole from very far away. This notion of critical curve or region in the sky where you have to aim light rays for them to get perfectly trapped is a function of where you are in the geometry. And we're always used to drawing it as though we're infinitely far away because that's what relevant, that is what relevant to EHD. But in this animation, they put the camera like 6 or 10M away from the black hole. So is it 3M or is it 3? The impact parameter for a Schwarzschild black hole is 3 root 3M, which is 5.2, 5.2-ish. Yeah. OK, so this is the last theoretical slide that I wanted to point to. Yeah, I have 10 minutes. So um, it's been known for a long time, actually, since the work of, I think, Mashun and Ferrari, and then Ayer and Will in the 80s, that for a Schwarzschild black hole, 
you can compute these quasi-normal modes that we, we heard about this morning, which are the characteristic nodes or frequencies of the black hole. They're fixed by the geometry. And in the icono limit, which is when the frequencies are high, so they correspond to modes with large angular momentum L, they're actually controlled by the, by the photon ring and the bound orbits. And if you go back to the papers from the 80s, they explicitly say, you know, our analysis assumes this form for the radial potential, which Schwarzschild matches, but Kerr does not. And so people have said for 40 years that, yeah, it kind of works the same for Kerr, but it's amazing that nobody, nobody looked at it in detail. Until 2012, there was a group at Caltech that actually rigorously showed that this photon shell controls the quasi normal mode spectrum for a Kerr black hole, but they didn't have the critical exponents gamma, delta, tau computed yet, so they didn't have a simple explicit formula. I think we were the first to show this last year. So this is the formula for the quasi normal mode spectrum of a Kerr black hole in the icono limit, which means large angular momentum or large frequency. So that's when the wave is a, is, has a very high frequency, so it looks like a narrow wave packet, and you can approximate it by congruence of knowledge at E6. I'm, I'm going to say that very, yeah, that's a very good point. So um, just to back up for a second, even in Schwarzschild, there is no analytic formula for the exact quasi-normal mode spectrum. It's something that you have to compute numerically. And in Kerr, it's super hard to compute it numerically unless you go to Emanuele Berti's website, where you have like gigabytes of numerically computed data. And now there are even Mathematica packages that can do it for you. But it is kind of frustrating that this you know, key characteristic of Kerr black holes, there isn't a simple formula for, unless you take one of the three labels on the uh, frequencies to be large. So there's a large overtone limit when n is large that was computed by Uri Keshet and uh, Shahar Had and Andy Knightsky. But there's only like two or three papers on this. I think it should be explored more. And then there's the icono limit where you take L and M to be large, keeping N fixed. And that's what I'm talking about. So as was pointed out by someone in the audience, I have to scale L to be large, but then I have to scale also M to be large. So I take both spherical harmonic numbers to, to be large, keeping the ratio M over L fixed. And now this is the key cool point. This is the payoff from the critical exponents. Notice that M ranges from minus L to plus L. It can take two L plus one values, right? So when I take M and L to be large, keeping the ratio fixed, the ratio M over L becomes a parameter that ranges from minus one to plus one. And here's the analytic formula for the iconal QNM spectrum of a Kerr black hole. In terms of the critical exponents of the photon shell, what you do is, if you give me a large L and M and N, the first thing I do is I take the ratio M over L, and then that gives me an inclination for a bound orbit. I go to the radius where the bound photon is oscillating with an inclination sine theta that is equal to that ratio M over L. And M over L goes from minus one to plus one, and that's why I had to define mu to be the sine inclination that also goes from minus one to plus one. And then the real part of the quasi-normal mode frequency, which tells us the how it oscillates, how the wave oscillates, is L plus a half times the angular momentum of the bound orbit at that radius, which is analytically known. And then the imaginary part is minus I times N plus a half, where N is the overtone number, times a Lyapunov exponent gamma L, which is just the ratio of the orbital instability Lyapunov gamma divided by the orbital period tau. This is super explicit. So all you do is you look at these null geodesics in the photon shell, you compute these critical exponents, and they end up controlling the spectrum of Kerr quasi normal modes. And I should say this approximation is basically excellent by the time L is four. That's, and you know, we know in physics that when you take a large end limit and then you set N equals to three, that's already pretty good. And in this case for L equals three, the error is only 10%. And by L equals four, it's, it's an excellent approximation. So this is a really cool formula. And the punchline is the photon ring, the black hole ring down is controlled by the photon ring. No, this is valid for a small n. Ah, but L equals M equals two is not. Yeah, yeah. so I think. I completely agree. And what I think is, but I think that's a cool feature of this, which is you're never gonna see L equals 10, probably. 
But the high L part of the spectrum, which is exactly what's not described by the psychomal regime and what LIGO and Lisa can't see, is actually what you could in principle test by measuring these rings and their critical exponents, which are observable quantities in principle. So it's, it's a completely complementary window into strong gravity and also the QNM spectrum, which I think is really cool and an added reason for why we should do this. And of course, we're not competing with LIGO and Lisa. It's, just, you know, it's not either or. I think we should do both. It's just super cool that we have these two different handles on this physics. Is your paper containing the details of derivation? Yes. Yes, which is not trivial. But I mean, I will say this is, of course, uh, just the fact that effectively, when you go from the particle to the wave, the wave packet has some spread. And so you can't perfectly localize it on the shell, It'll, the fact that the orbits are unstable means that if you have a wave packet now that has some width, it's always going to decay. And that's why there's an imaginary part and that's why the quasi modes are always decaying. That's the intuition. And I'm not going to go into this, but there's a conformal symmetry. There's actually, okay, notice that the imaginary part of the frequency has an integer spacing. And I asked Emmanuel Berti, is, is, it, is there a known reason why that must be? And he's like, no. But in our way of deriving it, we use conformal symmetry, and then the quasi-normal mode frequencies, the quasi-normal modes form uh, representations of SL2R, and so the, the, they're actually highest weight representations, and that explains naturally why there's an integer spacing of the modes. And this is not true at low L, so this is like an emergent conformal symmetry. There's this whole other thing that I'm not going to go into, but this photon shell you can show has a conformal symmetry in phase space, which sounds mysterious. We've written some papers trying to link this to holography, but it's kind of the wild, wild west. I, there's something there, but I don't have a sharp statement. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is the summary of the entire theory part of the, of the discussion. It's a prediction of general relativity that embedded within an image of a black hole, there should lie a thin photon ring, which is itself composed of a stack of self-similar subrings. So they're self-similar because each subring is a lens image of the same thing, the main emission but indexed by the number of photon half orbits executed around the black hole. And the structure, the, the subring structure within the, the photon ring is characterized by three effects, the demagnification, time delay, and rotation, which are completely governed by these critical parameters, gamma, delta, tau, which are predicted by the Kerr geometry and we've computed analytically for the first time. And they're in principle observable things that maybe in my lifetime we'll get to measure. Interestingly, they're not just fundamental constants, they're actual functions around the circle. So if you were to measure this demagnification factor, you could measure it at every angle. You're not measuring just one number, but you're measuring a, a function's worth of numbers as you go around the image. So this should be a really interesting constraint. And the last thing I want to point out is that these photon subrings that converge to a specific shape, which is that of the critical curve or what is sometimes called the shadow, um, but the shadow, which is analytically known, is not in itself observable. What is observable are these photon rings, which converge to it, but don't actually have a shape that's sharply fixed. And a huge challenge of making a prediction for the shape of this photon ring is to know what is the precise shape of, say, the n equals 1, or maybe the n equals 2 photon rings, which are the things that are most easily accessible to measurement, but they haven't converged to the critical curve yet, and so they're visibly different. And the kinds of experiments we're envisioning could, tell, could see the difference between the, the ring and the curve. So I'm a little over time. The last message I want to convey is that uh, we're not going to see the ring the way that our eyes see images in the sky or the way that your camera takes a picture. We're measuring these uh, black holes. We're seeing these black holes with an interferometer. And what the interferometer really sees is the Fourier transform of the image. And so. Uh, the key thing to understanding what is the signature of the photon ring for experiments is to understand what is the Fourier transform of a ring. And it turns out if you have a, a very sharp ring, then in Fourier space, what happens is that as you go to larger and larger momenta, you see a Fourier transform that uh, decays. So it's not uniform like in one dimension, we're in 2D here, but it has a very weak power law fall off. And it has a ringing pattern. And the key point, this is all you need to understand, is that the periodicity of this ringing is set by the diameter of the ring. OK? So uh, I could spend a whole hour explaining how interferometry works. But the only point I want you to take away is the following. Uh, if you put a satellite 
in orbit around the Earth, and you, set, you let it orbit in the plane perpendicular to the line of sight to the black hole, and you let it uh, take its interferometric measurements, then as it goes around the Earth along its orbit, at, at some angle var phi in the plane perpendicular to the line of sight, your interferometer is going to measure some ringing. And the periodicity of that ringing, which is the observable that's most easily measured, will encode the diameter of the ring at the corresponding image, at the corresponding angle in the image. So you go around the orbit, you see some ringing pattern. That tells you, that periodicity tells you what is the diameter of this ring at that same angle in the image. Is that clear? I haven't proved this to you. It's like you have to know interferometry, but that's what it shakes down to. And so then the last question to answer, to, to know what is the prediction for what we're going to see, is just what is the angle dependent diameter of the ring? And like Daniel alluded to this morning, it looks like a perfect circle to our eyes, but actually it has minute deviations from being perfectly circular. And what we showed, which takes a lot of really hard work, is that there's a prediction for d phi, the angle dependent diameter of this ring, as you go around the image. And it has to take this functional form. That is a prediction from the Kerr hypothesis in general relativity. And it's not obvious because it doesn't come from the critical curve, the thing that's easy to compute analytically. You have to put models, astrophysical models around the black hole, ray trace them, see these photon rings, which have a different shape, and then measure that. And it's a very long and complicated story. We did it for Kerr. And as far as I know, the only person that's gone all the way and done it for a beyond Kerr space time, including fuzzballs, is uh, Daniel Meyerson and one of his students, Stellens, and some collaborators who actually looked at non Kerr geometries and did the whole exercise and found a different shape. So the point is, if you see a ring and it, has, it doesn't have the shape, it can't be a Kerr black hole. That's a very strong statement. Now, maybe the experiment doesn't work. Maybe you don't see a ring for whatever reason. But if you do see a ring, it has to have this particular functional form for the Kerr geometry, according to the Kerr geometry. That's a very sharp test. And we did an experimental forecast with Sam Grella and Dan Moroni, who's a leading EHT experimentalist, showing that in principle, we could do this experiment with today's technology, and we think we'd be able to measure this to very high precision, and that would give us an extremely stringent test of general relativity. We can quantify all this, but um, I just want to leave you with a big picture. And uh, what's exciting, this goes back to Nick's question, is that there's a lot of people now, this is a recent story. We just started doing the calculations in the past like three, four years. But there's now huge interest from astronomers to actually go and see this because it's super cool. And uh, there's different missions being proposed to NASA to, to do this. And uh, I'll just point out, this is an inflatable antenna that was deployed in 96. This thing really flew and, and worked. And if you go to Elgard's website, they say they do Skunk Works projects, which is code for Department of Defense. And there hasn't been a public mission since then, but I'm told that they've been flying these things and pointing them down, not up. And uh, so apparently this is a quite mature technology and there's plans to deploy one to uh, measure the photon ring. And I'm happy to tell you all about the intricate details of the timeline. This is my last slide. The idea is to actually have an elliptical orbit and the orbit would precess such that uh, when, the photon, when the satellite is very near the Earth, we could hook it into the EHT array and take a super pretty picture, a higher resolution dynamic range. When the uh, satellite is on an inbound or outbound orbit, it would actually be able to see the n equals one ring. And at apogee, it would be so far that it would actually pick up the n equals two ring, but only at one angle in the image. And then by having this elliptical orbit precess, we could fill out the image plane and measure the periodicity of the n equals two ring also at every angle. And so that's the goal. And uh, there's a proposal due later this year. And then there's two more cycles of proposals for NASA in 2025 and 2026. And this is going to get proposed every time now because people are excited about it. And I think it's just a matter of time until we, we get the mission and we see it. So thank you for your time. Hope you guys are excited. If anybody asks, you should say this is a great experiment. And you totally want NASA to do it. <laughs> Thank you.
how much does this cost? Yeah, so so I talked to Lyman Page, who, who's this, uh, you know, he actually launched space missions to measure the CMB background. And so the, the way you do this is you propose a mission at every price point. So NASA approved a, a probe mission. The budget is one to $1.5 billion. That's being selected this fall. And there's a proposal being submitted for a satellite that would do a bunch of stuff, including look for, I mean, to first order approximation, NASA is really into finding aliens, which is kind of shocking, but they look for water on exoplanets, which is really code for alien life. So everyone is doing water on exoplanets and searching for aliens. And, uh, you know, the idea is to do some actual science on top of that too. So there's a proposed probe mission. There's a proposal going in this fall for a billion dollar probe that would do a bunch of stuff, including see the photon ring. So piggybacking on top of an existing thing. And then there's a SMEX mi mission, which is small expenditure cap. That's up to $130 million. That's being proposed in 2025. That could only see N equals one. And then in 2026, there's a mid-X, which is medium expenditure. That's up to $300 million. And there's at least two groups that are already thinking about competing missions. I'm not sure how it's all gonna shake out, but I'm happy to see that there's a lot of different competing groups that wanna make this happen. And um, yeah, so basically the key is you propose the $100 million mission that does N equals one, you propose the $300 million mission, which maybe does N equals two, and you also propose the billion dollar thing which can do both, and then you hope you just keep doing this until one of them. So as, as much as you want, basically, it can cost as much as much money as you want to throw at it to, to do. So basically, the farther the satellite is, the more money, the, the higher resolution you have, yeah. and so the easier it is to see these sharp features. And the n equals one ring, we're just barely on the boundary of seeing the the Earth diameter is just not quite large enough for the two most disparate telescopes on the surface of the Earth to see it. So I think if you could just go into even low Earth orbit. Uh, you could probably see the n equals one. So it's kind of the low hanging fruit that I think we're gonna see first. And then if you go to about eight earth diameters away, we think then you're in n equals two territory. That's lunar distance, by the way. And that's harder and more expensive, but also doable with today's technology, we think. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Any, I'm, any maybe urgent questions then before we? Yeah. Okay. We should just move on. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I'm here until Friday. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to tell you about all this stuff offline. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank Alex again. Are we starting at 3.30? 3.30? Are we starting at 3.30? Oh, we don't have a coffee break now. Oh. Oh, sorry. I, I... Sorry. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I thought we had a coffee break after everything. No, no, no. Too much erroneous. Coffee. Too much coffee. How can we have uh, yeah. too much coffee? Well, let's go and get some fucking with the fuckers, okay? Yeah, really. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I just, uh, didn't look at the schedule. Uh, well, it's only on the Zoom, I think. Is it okay? Say something? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, Masik uh, from uh, University of Warsaw is going to talk about extremal black holes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity Can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so I'm afraid uh, my talk is going to be uh, much less focused on phen phenomenology uh, in comparison to what we've heard so far. Mm. So let me start by saying a few words about cold black holes in general, uh, or f first of all, why should you actually care about them? Uh, so from the mathematical point of view, extremal black holes are uh, very special and uh, there are some exceptions to uh, black hole uniqueness theorems and you need to prove a lot of things uh, in a different way for them. Uh, since they have zero 
uh, Hawking temperature, um, they don't radiate at least thermally. So you could hope for some simplified quantum description. Uh, they are also in the same spirit and motivation for the weak gravity conjecture that, that gives you some constraints on possible UV completions of uh, Einstein-Maxwell theory. Uh, I will mention weak gravity conjecture uh, at the end of my talk. Um, in the idea CFT dictionary, optimal black holes uh, are what happens close to the horizon uh, are supposed to describe the infra infrared uh, fixed points uh, of the CFT at the boundary and probably uh, <coughs> uh, all supersymmetric black holes are, are extremal and probably the most important feature for uh, people here is that uh, extremal black holes are really important for the microstate counting. Uh, so, uh, and uh, today I'm not going to talk about microstates, but I will mention entropy at some point. So that's almost it. Uh, so close to the extremal horizon, we can introduce uh, coordinate systems that looks like this. This is say a metric and Maxwell field. And then we can make some uh, simple diffeomorphism in which we rescale time and uh, radius in the inverse manners. So physically that corresponds to just going closer and closer to the horizon. And uh, despite the fact that this is only diffeomorphism in you, if you rescale by a non-zero number, uh, the pullbacks of this metric and of the Maxwell field have good limits uh, in the limit of this parameter going to zero. And then they define a new solution to the Einstein-Maxwell, say ADS equations. Uh, which describes a uh, region only very close uh, to the horizon. So you get some simplified equations. Now, anything, nothing depends on, uh, after taking this limit, the only dependence on R is uh, implicit, uh, is explicit. Uh, so everything depends implicitly on the on angles. And you get some simplified equations, uh, uh, simplified equations for the geometry of the horizon. And you can further simplify them, assuming that uh, the space name is static. Uh, and you, you can prove some uniqueness theorems, for example, for, for static solutions, uh, for uh, static solutions in four dimensions uh, must, must be ADS2 times some uh, maximally symmetric space, so either S2 or torus or something like that. And you also have uh, a uniqueness theorem for uh, axially symmetric uh, horizons. Um, so the, in, uh, what that means is that uh, in four dimensions, uh, if you consider non spheric let's focus, for example, on static black holes. Uh, in four dimensions, it means that if you consider boundary conditions for ADS that are actually not spherically symmetric, which holographically would mean that you put your C on some non-homogeneous background, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, the horizon is still going to be spherically symmetric. And that's because this horizon is infinitely far away, uh, infinitely far away from the boundary conditions. So you could expect that you lose the information about what is going on at infinity. And today I want to show that, uh, uh, I want to convince you that this simple uh, uh, intuition is too simple. And actually there is plenty of stuff that happens very close to the horizon, which is very sensitive to what happens at infinity. Uh, so the first chapter in my story is in four dimensions with a negative cosmological constant. And I want to convince you that actually almost all extremal black holes are singular in this setting. So uh, by extremal, I mean that I want to consider black holes with a finite temperature, then I want to cool them and to see whether the limit is uh, smooth or not. Mm. So let us start with a super simple example. So on the background of Reisner Norsum ADS, we can consider a massless scalar field. Uh, field and we want, since I want to tell something about general black holes with general black conditions, we should look for stationary solutions uh, to this. And since the background is spherically symmetric, uh, we can separate 
uh, variables and then just get a simple OD for the radio, uh, for this uh, claim uh, for every mode. And now uh, at the horizon in the extremal case, uh, we have a regular singular point. So we can approximate it by the Euler equation or just uh, say that close to the horizon, we're going to have x, uh, we're going to have power law behavior of this field uh, with the component that uh, is giving in this way. Uh, so we have two possible solutions, either plus or minus here. We must choose if we want this, um, if we want this solution to be, say, continuous at the horizon, we must choose plus sign uh, because otherwise it would be uh, actually diverging at the horizon. Uh, you should not be surprised by this formula because essentially uh, L times L plus one divided by R plus squared is a mass of, uh, uh, of a Kaluza Klein mode with L equal, uh, with a particular L. And then this factor comes from the ADS to radius. So this is very similar to uh, the scaling dimension of any field with, with a particular mass in ADS2. Uh, in particular, if we choose in this uh, equation L equal one, uh, then this factor is going to be smaller than, than L times L plus one is two. So this is eight and uh, uh, we divide it by something uh, larger than one because lambda is negative. Uh, so this whole thing uh, is actually smaller than three. So it follows that, uh, that this exponent is smaller than one as long as we have some charge and uh, and uh, and cosmological constant is ne negative. So as a result, energy momentum tensor, or at least its row row component, uh, actually diverges at the horizon. It has some power law behavior. Mm. So you, the first thing that you learn in your GR course is that you should not trust your coordinate systems and GR is really about stuff that is coordinate independent. And here, this, this is just some component of energy momentum tensor. So maybe it's just a problem with this coordinate system. Uh, so you could ask uh, about scalar quantities like the trace or square of uh, of that thing, but all possible scalar quantities are actually finite here. So that would perhaps could suggest that there is just a problem with the coordinate system, uh, but this is not the case because this d upon d rho is actually tangent to the affinely parametrized null geodesics. So it has a clear geometrical meaning. And moreover, it's exactly this uh, this component over here that enters Rachel Dury equation that describes what happens with uh, null geodesics. So this is clearly a sign of a physical singularity, although it is not expressed in any scalar quantities. And in general, we will see that for almost all extremal black holes in ADS, tidal forces in the null direction that is transversal to the horizon, so exactly this d upon zero direction, are infinite. And notice that in this simple example, we didn't really use uh, the boundary conditions at any point. This was very local. Uh, these were very local considerations. And the only source uh, and the only role for the boundary conditions at infinity are going to be, uh, uh, they're going to provide sources uh, for the modes that are to diverge at the horizon. Uh, so now we move from Klein-Gordon uh, field to Einstein-Maxwell. So uh, since we are interested in stuff that uh, happens close to the horizon, we may just try to uh, uh, we may just try our metric as near horizon metric plus some small perturbation that is supposed to vanish at the horizon. And so by some sort of continuity, it should be small outside. And the same with the Maxwell field. Uh, thus, it would seem reasonable since that this thing is small and this thing is small that they should satisfy linearized uh, Einstein-Maxwell equations on this background. Uh, 
And if they satisfy linear Einstein equations, we can decompose them with respect to the symmetries of this background. And this background has not only uh, time translation symmetry, but it is uh, it's all, also always have uh, rescaling symmetry that comes from taking the new horizon limit. Uh, so we may decompose our perturbations in terms of eigen. Uh, so these are still stationary because we want to describe black holes, but moreover, we can take them to be power loss close, close to the horizons. Then it's not hard to check that with this sort of ansatz, uh, the vial certain components of the vial tensor and of the rigid tensor are going to have also a power law behavior. So we see that perturbations are going to be singular provided that this exponent gamma is smaller than two and well, different than one. Uh, exponent equal one is very special. Uh, nevertheless, this does, despite the fact that it's possible to get this uh, singularity, it does not mean that uh, these solutions are uh, ill-defined. We could make sense of them as weak solutions to Einstein-Maxwell equations as long as this exponent is uh, larger than one half. So some threshold for that. And now we have, uh, and now you just plug everything and solve linearized Einstein equations. Uh, so that's very simple. And we, uh, uh, for example, for Reisner Nordstrom ideas, you can al also decompose everything also into spherical harmonics. So then the whole problem is actually purely algebraic. And here we have a few leading modes. So the lowest lying one uh, corresponds to L equal two, and it's, uh, it always have gamma smaller than one. So if it's smaller than one, it means that uh, we have the singularity. Uh, and moreover, this, uh, this component of uh, the vial tensor measures exactly tidal forces uh, for infalling null observer, uh, infalling null particles. Uh, so these uh, tidal, tidal forces are diverging at the horizon. And moreover, since gamma is smaller than one, this exponent here is smaller than minus one. So, the, the, so this, uh, these tidal forces are not integrable. So it means that they will lead to some really noticeable effect on the, whatever matter distribution is falling inside. And moreover, if our black hole is large enough, roughly speaking of the ADS radius, uh, then this exponent is also smaller than one half. So that would mean that we no longer have uh, weak solutions to the Einstein equations. And perhaps surprisingly, we found that the larger the black hole is, uh, the, biggest, uh, the bigger the singularity is going to be. So this exponent is getting smaller. Mm. Uh, so that may be somehow counterintuitive because usually we think about small black holes as uh, being singular. Uh, if our black hole is uh, large enough, then also uh, other modes are going to be singular as well. Uh, since we are in four dimensions, we have duality between electric and magnetic charges. So the, exactly the same will, will, ha will happen for magnetically charged black holes. And also for different topologies with, with an exception of small toroidal black holes that are free from the singularity, but uh, sufficiently large toroidal black holes are singular as well. And for uh, positive lambda, we would see that this curve starts here and then grows. So for small, uh, so for positive uh, cosmological constant, if the charge is small, then uh, we have singularity, and then for large ones, we don't have it. Uh, if, the lamb, uh, if the cosmological constant is zero, then these exponents are exactly integers, so everything is nice and smooth. Mm, you can play the same game with other ideas. Uh, in this case, it's easier to actually to uh, work with the curvature directly because uh, because exactly the component of the valid tensor that we want to probe is, uh, enters uh, the Tchaikovsky equation. Uh, and then 
so now we will work with the exponent that is actually exponent for the valid tensor. So it's the previous one minus two. And here, here we have a result from the Tchaikovsky equation for the lowest merge. Uh, we see that uh, this exponent for the valid tensor is also uh, <coughs> always negative. So again, it means that uh, that we have this sort of singular uh, uh, that we have this uh, uh, singularity for, for at least for this mode. Mm. And now we would like to move to mm, so this was linear analysis, and now let us move to the nonlinear case. Uh, and sure. <clears throat> to this component of the wild tensor as an observable, mm -hmm. but it, it, it has components, so it's not in coordinate invariant. Yes. It's yeah, but you can ju you you can consider in falling in falling null geodesics. Uh, that, that goes towards the horizon. And the, uh, this is exactly the component, exactly this component of the vial tensor would enter into, um, <coughs> uh, uh, into geodesic deviation equation. Can I contract this C with null vectors and make it a scalar that diverges? At the horizon? Uh, yeah, you, I mean, this is uh, so these two are already contracted with a null. Okay. Yeah, so okay. if you would okay. then contract it with some yeah. uh, angle vectors, then it would diverge. Yeah. And one last question All the singularities you're talking about, can I interpret them as a, a breakdown of perturbation theory? No, that's that's a great uh, point. Thank you. The, po uh, the point is actually that. Uh, that the metric and the Maxwell field, they're actually uh, close to the horizon, that they're still small. Uh, only the, the derivatives are, uh, are large. So if you would go to the second order in perturbation theory, you, you would see then the scaling with this exponent times two. So uh, this is not a breakdown of perturbation theory as we will see in a moment from the nonlinear simulations. Thanks. Mm. Um, so it's actually very hard to probe extremal black holes numerically. So instead, we'll work with black holes that are that are close to extremality and then lower the temperature. Uh, and in part, because we know that uh, nearly extremal black holes are very uh, uh, <coughs> they, they they are very similar to extremal ones. In particular, they have a very long finite but long ADS2 throat. And thus we expect that in this throat, tidal forces should still grow like a power law, but then the, this region ends shortly before the horizon, uh, roughly speaking uh, at the distance set by the temperature. And this, thus we could argue that the vile tensor at the horizon should behave like some power law of the temperature. Uh, because we, d we expect that when this ADS turgeon uh, ends, then there shouldn't be any sudden change in the vial tensor, so it should be roughly speaking the same thing. Uh, so in particular, it has the same exponent as at t equals zero. Mm. And here we have some results for, uh, uh, for from full, uh, uh, nonlinear Einstein Maxwell equations. This is log log plot. So the fact that we have straight line shows that we have power law behavior and we have quite nice agreement between numerical and linearized exponents. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, it seems that everything is actually fine with perturbation theory and there is no effort uh, and uh, um, yeah. Uh, once again, th thanks for the question. Um, moreover, let me mention that since Einstein theory is nonlinear, if you just uh, if <coughs> uh, if you source one mode, you would expect by nonlinearity. Uh, if you uh, far away, you source one mode, for example, by imposing non-spherically symmetric boundary conditions at infinity, then you would expect that at the horizon, all possible modes will be. 
uh, turned on due to nonlinearity. Mm. Uh, if we go now to the second order in the perturbation theory, we can uh, show that the, entry, that the area of the black hole uh, at finite temperature changes uh, by this uh, something proportional to this temperature to the to gamma. In, part in particular, if this gamma is smaller than one half, and we saw that at least for sufficiently charged black holes, it is smaller than one half, uh, then this dominates over the usual linear re relation for the entropy. So in particular, if we would calculate specific heat, we would find out that it has some anomalous, uh, uh, that it has some anomalous uh, scaling with the temperature at very low temperatures, and that would be a clear sign for the holographic theory. Uh, and here we again have some results from uh, nonlinear simulations that it is exactly that what happens. Uh, so this, re uh, this black line is the result for just Reisner Nordstrom. Uh, the red line is uh, the, limiting, uh, val the limiting value for, uh, for the uh, perturb metric, and these purple dots are numerical results. Uh, let us just for a moment go to the Euclidean sector. We make a weak, uh, weak rotation. Uh, let's say for of our static solutions to avoid any <coughs> uh, to avoid complex metric, um, metrics. Then, uh, as we mentioned, all the curvature scalars are finite, and since they're time independent after weak rotation, they're still finite. So it would it follows that extremal uh, Euclidean black holes are going to be perfectly smooth because in a Euclidean signature you can only measure uh, you can only measure uh, non-smoothness through uh, scalar quantities. Mm. So it would suggest that our solutions are actually physical. You can prepare them using Euclidean uh, using gravitational path integral, for example. And so you shouldn't just discard them and say that, uh, oh, it's very unphysical thing to take this temperature to zero or whatever. And moreover, it follows that all higher curvature corrections are going to be actually small because they're small at, uh, in this case. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you don't expect them to be able to restore smoothness at the horizon. So this is something you should live with. Uh, but now, nevertheless, let us add quantum corrections but to the asymptotically flat black holes. Because as I said at some point, they have these integers equal, uh, the, they have these integer exponents. So if you take even the smallest uh, quantum correction, it is possible that it will kick it out of being integer and then you get to see something. Um, <clears throat> so what we are essentially doing is that we are adding to uh, to the, our, our action, a few additional terms. So uh, you can show that the lowest terms that you should add to pure GR are uh, uh, this cubic t the term. And then you have two terms with eight derivatives. All other terms can be canceled out by filter definitions and some integration by parts. So this is uh, Adding this to the Einstein-Hilbert action is the most general action that you can write up to eight derivatives uh, in the metric. And we believe that these uh, coefficients, uh, eta, lambda, and lambda tilde are going to be small because they probably comes from whatever quantum corrections you have. Yeah? You're saying that you're throwing terms by integration by parts? But I understand that this assumes that the boundary term vanishes, but you want to get something that is singular eventually at the, at the boundary. So is it ju really justified to throw away uh, boundary We terms? are just looking at the equations of motion. You, you still throw away boundary terms if you just consider these terms and you don't consider other, other terms that you throw away by integration, integration mm -hmm. by parts. Okay, that's, that's a good point point and uh, I think that okay so I think what you would actually me measure would be tidal forces that are felt by infalling observers 
and you you can measure them before they actually cross the horizon so then you don't need to worry about what happens exactly at the horizon only close to it so i don't think that that should matter for this okay thank you uh, uh, so we assume that these higher uh, high curvature corrections are small so we're just going to linearize everything in terms of the coefficients mm. and then it's actually possible to find uh, EFT corrected New Horizon geometry of care, and then we can perturb it by this sort of transversal deformations as we did before. And at the end of the day, uh, we get the following expression for the lowest exponent. It starts with two, and then we have three terms like this, and then there would be some corrections of higher order. Mm. So we see that uh, we see that whether we have the singularity or not depends only on the sign of these, uh, only on the signs of these coefficients. Um, uh, a cool feature of that is actually that this is exponent for sort of S-wave uh, uh, care. So it's not, now we don't even need to put anything at infinity to source this. It's this, this particular mode is automatically sourced by, uh, for, for asymptotically flat care. So if this happens to be smaller than two, then you get singularity for EFT corrected care without any additional, uh, without any additions. Uh, so one can prove using the properties of the QFT that any uh, UV complete theory must have this lambda and lambda tilde positive. Mm, and that's actually good because here they comes with a negative sign. So it means that uh, these two terms contribute uh, negatively to the exponent. So if we ignore this thing, it's this is smaller than two. Mm. In particular for type two, uh, string theory, you get expression like this. Uh, on the other hand, this eta has logarithmic uh, divergence at two loops due to where well, either photon or graviton loops. Um, but I ignoring that for a moment, close to the UV cutoff, it behaves like this. Uh, so in particular, it's, uh, for standard, uh, standard model matter content, it's going to be negative because uh, here we are summing over particles uh, that are massive. So MS are scalars, MF are fermions, and MVs are uh, massive vectors. And the lightest particles that we have in the standard model are uh, neutrinos that are fermions. So this contributes with a negative sign. And then it's again, good because this now enters with a plus sign here. So it means that all these three terms are actually negative. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, this uh, two loop log, log divergence that I mentioned makes this whole thing positive in the infrared, but perhaps surprisingly, if you evaluate these corrections at the scale of Schwarzschild radius of supermassive black hole or something like that, then you still get that this, uh, that this terms dominates over this uh, log divergence. So from the point of view of, uh, so from the point of view of this EFT, uh, actually uh, supermassive black holes are still UV particles. Mm. Uh, I f yeah, I, f I, let, I think we took it slightly smaller than Planck. Mm. And no, now one co more cool thing is that this result that we get, this singularity, uh, depends really on the matter content of your theory. In particular, this is, uh, this eta is exactly zero for supersymmetric black holes and then this lambda is positive so you get the singularity but if we had particles uh, scalar particles that are super light and at least in some cosmological models 
there conjecture it is conjectured that we should have su such particles that are super weakly interacting so we're not going to see them in any accelerator but if there are such particles then they can actually change the sign of this thing and if they can change sign, sign of this thing, that would mean that suddenly we wouldn't have a singularity. So in a sense, this is a gravitational measure. Uh, this is a gravitational way of measuring the matter content of your theory. And because everything uh, interacts with the gravity in the same way, it doesn't really matter that this matter content is very weakly coupled. So now the fundamental question would be, can we actually measure it? And the answer is, well, no. Uh, so we actually have a few uh, black holes that are relatively close to the relative uh, to extremality in our uh, universe. I think the fastest spinning one has a uh, of order 0.95 or something like that, but it's still way too uh, slow to actually uh, so that we could be actually measure the this exponent uh, gamma. Yeah. So you have any intuition on the error of that kind of thing? Because you know they're claiming very high intuition that all the mathematics are there. Yeah, I, I, th I think the, uh, so I think this is between 0 0.92 up to 0 0.95, depending on the model that you're using. Uh, so, in either case, it's uh, it's too slow rotation for us. Um, so, what one could do further with this would be to connect this story to Schwarzian because we expect um, non-perturbative quantum corrections close to the extremality. Uh, and here, everything was classic, uh, semi-classical. Uh, one could ask if there are other astrophysical observables that we could actually reasonably probe. And perhaps one could interpret the change uh, in this uh, exponents in terms of CAR CFT because these modes and the uh, corresp correspond to some operators in CFT dual to CAR. So that means that higher curvature corrections actually change uh, and they actually change uh, dimensions of these operators, but we don't really know what it means. Um, and it would be really cool to see this anomalous scaling of the specific heat in CFT. And again, the, there will be some competition between this effect on non-homogeneities and uh, of the short sum corrections to the black hole thermodynamics. And now it's time to move to five dimensions. And uh, in five dimensions, this effect is much stronger. And I will just restrict myself to Reisner Nordstrom. Uh, so we can uh, do the whole analysis again. And then we would find out that generically, uh, uh, I, I, now we are perturbing around near horizon of five dimensional Reisner Nordstrom, possibly with cosmological constant. And then we get that generically without the cosmological constant, we get something that is C0 at the horizon, but not C1. Uh, if the uh, cosmological constant is negative, then this exponent is actually now negative. And that would mean that, well, first of all, our perturbation uh, scheme really breaks down now. And that means that if we change uh, the boundary conditions at the infinity, even in the slightest way, then we get totally. Then we can get totally different geometry at the horizon. So it means that this time, even this, despite the fact that we are infinitely far away from the from the boundary, uh, this uh, horizon is really uh, sensible to what happens at infinity. Mm. The same holds in higher dimensions, even without a cosmological constant. And what happens with, uh, posit with positive cosmological constants really depends on the charge of the black hole. So from the holographic point of view, what it means is that if you put, if you take uh, your favorite CFT that corresponds to Einstein-Maxwell and you put it on a background that is not exactly spherically symmetric, uh, so, for example, you perturb the space-time a little bit in a stationary manner, uh, then uh, uh, then you are in a different phase 
of the CFT. Mm. Let me just quickly comment on what happens in um, uh, without, a pos uh, without a cosmological constant. So uh, in 5D, we get this null singularity as we had uh, in 4D with a negative cosmological constant. And in, dimension, in higher dimensions, we again get this uh, instability with respect to faraway sources. Mm. And this is connected to some well-known results about singularities of higher dimensional Majumdar Papapedru black holes. So it seems that, um, but at the time I think it was just treated as some fact of life. And now it seems that they, 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 they're singular because they have to be singular. And actually it's sort of surprising because they are less singular that they should be. There are some modes close to the horizon that are actually not turned on. So it, Mm. Okay, but now uh, we want to understand what's the endpoint of this uh, uh, RG instability that I mentioned with negative cosmological constant. Mm. So now we just want to we want to solve uh, new horizon uh, equations like these ones uh, in five D. And now we put magnetic field to zero. So we are working with static, only electrically charged black holes. Uh, so we already know one solution that is unstable. It's rising and some ideas. So the natural thing would be just to perturb it. And then you can do it at the linear level. And then you would find out that uh, it makes sense only for some particular values of the charge. And then you can continue this sort of perturba uh, per perturbation scheme uh, around the horizons with this charge. And in this way, you can <coughs> create new horizons. Let me emphasize that now here we are working only with the geometry of the horizon. We are not looking at what happens outside the horizon. Mm. And in particular, we are uh, actually able to con we're able to construct uh, new horizon geometries without any uh, symmetries. And it, it seems that there is an infinite number of them. So we checked only up to some finite value of Q, but we don't see any reason why it should why it should stop working. So it seems that there is actually an infinite number of uh, of possible extremal horizons in 5D. Uh, but all of them are still R RG unstable. Uh, here we have uh, some plots describing like uh, how, how they charge depends on the entropy. Mm. Uh, since they're unstable, they're probably not very interesting uh, still because it would be actually very hard to construct boundary conditions such that you would flow exactly to this point. It was just a happy coincidence that uh, that spherically symmetric boundary conditions uh, flows to the horizon of Reisner Norton ADS5. And the problem with all these solutions is that uh, we are perturbing around solutions that are already unstable in a way that uh, the exponent is significantly smaller than one. So if we just make a small change in the geometry, they are it's not surprising that they are still unstable. Um, so to get something that could perhaps be stable, we should uh, expand around something that is um, a limiting case. So with the exponent equal exactly zero, but there is no such solution unless we take charge equal zero. But extrema black hole, extrema resonant notion with uh, charge equal zero has radius equal zero. So it's sort of, singular, um, but nevertheless, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, you can build a perturbation scheme around the singular solution. And actually, new geometries uh, at finite value of the perturbation are smooth. And perhaps surprisingly, the solution only exists perturbatively if we assume SO3 symmetry. So previously, uh, we were able to construct solutions without any symmetries at all. And here, um, and here the, only, the, the, the only solutions that actually exist must have SO3 symmetry. The instability mechan 
what is the physical mechanism for the instability? Is it discharge of the black hole uh, from charge Q to charge zero or what? I mean, okay, uh, let me say that this is not a dynamical instability, mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, probably what would happen if you would perturb it dynamically is that you, you would hit it, so something funny would happen. Uh, essentially, and you wouldn't really see that. Uh, so this is uh, singular. Uh, this is uh, ins instability in such a sense that we change the boundary conditions, but at minus infinity. This is in a way that it's still static. Okay. Right. So, so I don't think that there is any physical mechanism for that. Okay. Mm. Uh, so here we have, uh, we not only constructed these horizons, but we also constructed bulk, spa uh, uh, bulk space times with appropriate boundary conditions such that we get these horizons in the limit. And uh, here we get now the entropy as a function of charge uh, for different temperatures. And as uh, this dotted line is supposed to be line of uh, what, uh, this is the line that is described by this new horizon, uh, new horizon geometry. And uh, here we have uh, numerical results that essentially shows that uh, when we get uh, to colder and colder black holes, uh, then we are really approaching this new geometry. Mm. Uh, in Perhaps surprisingly, these, uh, uh, these new geometries have actually smaller entropy than uh, black holes of the same chart. So you would be inclined to say that they should be unstable, but on the other hand, we are at t equals zero. So, uh, this, so the entropy does not really enter the free energy. Mm. Geometrically, they look... Uh, sort of like this. So they are flattened at the, uh, at the poles and then they are uh, longer and uh, thinner uh, at the equators. Uh, so roughly speaking, they look like some pancakes. And then if you uh, increase the charge, they're going to be more and more like pancakes. And then at some point, uh, the curvature at the poles actually becomes negative. And in the limit of very large charges, these two geometries looks like two hyperbolic disks that are connected by some part of a sphere. And the, here we have a shape as a function of temperature. And here you... Uh, yeah, so this is what we expect. This is what happens for the perfect sphere. And we are getting, uh, we're getting close to this shape as we lower the temperature. Unfortunately, it seems that you really need to go to very low temperatures to see this shape properly. Mm. Now the question would be whether these uh, new uh, pancake geometries are stable. Uh, in this RG sense. And you can check that as long as you perturb them by something that preserves the SO3 symmetry, then they're stable. But when, uh, but for more general perturbations, we get, again find negative exponents. Uh, so that means that for generic bounded conditions, it's still not the correct solutions. And right now it seems that uh, there is no other near horizon geometry. There is no other extremal horizon, at, at least for small charges. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be RG stable at least. So we don't really know what the endpoint of this instability is. Uh, so we are not really able to probe this uh, inhomogeneous phase of the matter. Mm -hmm. But from the holographical point of view, perhaps even more interesting are planar black holes or toroidal ones. And mm, if we consider small torus, then actually we would see no instability, no singularity, nothing at all. And only, 
uh, and only when we increase the size of the stores or um, appropriately we would increase the charge, we would see this sort of instability. Uh, and somehow in the middle, we would see the singularity that we saw in four dimensions. So that would suggest that perhaps at least for toroidal black holes, uh, there is the endpoint of this instability that is described by uh, large black holes splitting into smaller ones. So we could have some sort of ADS fragmentation story, mm, but it is not really clear right now. Mm, okay. Before going to that, uh, let me just mention that although in four dimensions I said that one should try to understand how this connects with the Schwarzian and there is some competition at low temperatures between these two effects, I think that in 5D this, uh, this shows that you cannot uh, just naively follows uh, results from the Schwarzian uh, theory because uh, the way you uh, get JT gravity is through dimensional reduction, assuming that uh, assuming that you are working on a round sphere. And here we see that a small change in the boundary conditions leads to something that is not really round. Uh, so the, it seems that. Uh, in this case, uh, these non-perturbative uh, gravity effects are not going to invalidate this effect, and this is, and this is something that uh, should be understood uh, better. Uh, what's what's going on there, and what would be the proper quantum gravitational description uh, of such black holes? Mm. Now, a fourth-dimensional Reisner notion is on the verge of this instability uh, because it has uh, equal, ex the, the lowest exponent is equa exactly equal zero. And then it's again interesting questions whether higher curvature corrections could kick it and make it negative. And we find that indeed this exponent becomes negative if we assume weak gravity conjecture. And weak gravity conjecture, roughly speaking, claims that. Uh, is such a conjecture that your matter content, the matter content of your theory should be such that extrema rise notion should be able to um, decay into something. So you should have particles uh, or other objects that are uh, that have sufficiently high uh, charge to mass ratio. And now it seems that it also implies that uh, you wouldn't really see uh, that you wouldn't really see this uh, eczema black holes at all, at least in five dimensions, because whatever, if something would happen very far away from them, and uh, that would lead to uh, <coughs> some drastic change in their geometry. Mm. At least if we take into account higher curvature corrections. Um, so now the most important task, at least for me, would be to uh, find the endpoint of this uh, instability, where it seems that it may that it may contain some sort of ADS fragmentation story. Um, for toroidal black holes, uh, it should be easier, and it seems that they can also describe some novel phase transition uh, that is triggered by inhomogeneity at uh, of your CFT, so that would be good to understand and see whether it corresponds to anything, you know, real. Um, it would be good to come up with any um, new holographic probes of this of these new geometries. And since we are here, I think I should ask whether there is something similar that you could see for fastballs. To do that, you should probably go beyond supersymmetry. So I imagine that. Uh, it is probably rather a, a daring question, but hopefully uh, you may have some answers for me. Mm. And now to uh, summarize, I hopefully uh, convinced you that in ADS4, almost all extremal black holes are actually singular, um, that nearly extremal black holes have large tidal forces. If they have sufficient charge, they also have uh, anomalous scaling of the specific heat. So there is something funny on going on with the thermodynamics and that uh, extremal care with higher curvature corrections, even without any additional sources, 
also becomes uh, singular in 5D. Uh, extremal backcores are even uh, are even worse, and they are in fact uh, unstable with respect to the change in the boundary conditions. And we don't really know what the endpoint of this instability is. And there are in fact infinitely many new uh, extremal horizons that we found uh, that don't have any symmetries at all. Okay, so with that, let me finish. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Can all the black holes you discussed be embedded in string theory? Mm, I have no idea. Because you mentioned the relation to the gauge string duality, and formally it is valid only for black holes, well, in, in the context of string theory. Yeah, sure. But here we are using Einstein Maxwell, uh, which is uh, minimal supergravity. So that should be fine. OK. okay. Any more questions? Everybody ready for coffee? Okay. All right. Let's thank uh, 